Folks, this is such good news. The king has come to bring and to give the gift of righteousness, which means you are right with God if you will simply receive the gift that Jesus came to bring. Righteousness is a gift that cannot be earned. Righteousness is a gift that is certainly undeserved, but righteousness is a position that grants you supernatural status and transcendent emotions. Thanks for worshiping with us today. We are so excited you chose to be here this morning. Giving is a vital part of our relationship with God. And when you give at Faith Community, you can be assured that your giving is going to change lives. You can give online at faithtucson.org or on our mobile app. What a blessing. I think we can all agree it is to see our children showcase their passion for Christ and their joy in the Lord. Um, you know, it's, for me as a pastor, I believe that our next generation ministries, um, our kids and our youth, to me, they're the most important ministry that we have in the church. Um, in fact, according to Barna Research, and they've been doing this for, I think, 40 years, every 10 years they do it again. But on average, 94% of Christians say that they came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ before their 18th birthday. 94%. Uh, therefore, you know, from, from our vantage point, from my vantage point, there's no greater outreach and there's no greater inreach than to make sure that we're leading our kids to and discipling our kids with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you believe that and agree with that, would you say a big amen? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, good response. Uh, yeah, give God praise. All right. Um, let me also express my appreciation for Miss Brianna Boteo. She's our incredible children's ministry director. There you go. Uh, under her leadership this past year, we've seen our children's ministry just explode uh, numerically, spiritually, in all the different ways. I remember at times Dempsey might be the only kid in kids ministry a little, little over a year ago, and you saw how many kids are here at Faith Community Church now, and so <laughs> praise God for that. Uh, next Sunday, you're also going to get to see that, that next age group um, at our 10 a.m., Christmas Eve morning service, uh, more on that later on, but we're going to have one service next Sunday at 10 a.m. before the two afternoon services, but that 10 a.m. service, it, I'm calling it like a youth takeover service. Our teenagers are going to be leading us in worship. Our youth pastor, Pastor Matt Lewis, is going to be preaching. The kids or the teenagers are going to be passing out the outlines, running the welcome center, being the ushers, um, and so it's just going to be really awesome to see the, the next generation take a little bit of ownership and uh, I think it's going to plant some, some long-term seeds for the kingdom of God. And so we're looking forward to that. God is doing great things. Um, can we just give the Lord praise for what he's doing here at Faith Community Church? Thank you, God. All right. The snow has melted. Typical Tucson. Man. All right. On this last Sunday before Christmas Eve, my gift to you will be a 25-minute sermon. Amen. You're welcome. Of course, Zach, thank you. So if you have your Bibles, grab them and turn to Luke chapter two. Um, I'm excited to read the Christmas story to you because it is without fail that I can hear my dad's voice every time I read this text. Um, every Christmas morning for me, my dad would pull out his big King James Bible. He would open it to Luke chapter two and he would read the Christmas story to us. Um, this will be my fourth Christmas now without my dad. And um, his faith became sight in 2020. And yet, as I read this text, I can still see his face and I can still hear his voice reading Luke chapter two. So I'm blessed by that. Look at verse one of the second chapter. The birth of Jesus Christ. It says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Canarius... Every year, I worry I'm going to say that name wrong, but I nailed it again, baby. All right. Was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. 
And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, and you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And this is the word of the Lord. I want to title my shortest sermon of the year, Gifts from the King. But before we get into it, let me pray with you and for you. Father God, I just thank you for the opportunity that we've had this morning to to just be blessed by the joy and the passion and the faith of our kids. Thank you, Lord, that the future is bright here at Faith Community Church because we're seeing even the youngest among us learn to live their lives for you and for for your glory. Bless all the workers. Bless Brianna. Bless those people that just give so much of their time and effort. Bless these parents who care about making sure that their kids, yeah, have a good education and get to play in all the different hobbies and sports they want, but more importantly, that they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior and their God. Father, we thank you that uh, we get the time together as a church family to just open up your word and to hear from you and to enter into this, what is a high and holy week full of faith, full of love, full of joy, and what we could call full of wonder-filled appreciation for you. So whether we're here in this room or we're watching remotely online, God, I pray that whoever is under the sound of my voice, that you would move in their hearts even right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, my favorite part of Christmas growing up, besides Jesus, of course, and besides the Christmas Eve candlelight service, of course, my favorite thing was the one big gift that my parents would let me pick out after church on Christmas Eve night. Now, in hindsight, this was a brilliant parental plan. Because late on Christmas Eve night, mom and dad would let me and my older sister Jacqueline pick out one gift that we could set aside and that we could open without mom and dad there first thing Christmas morning. In other words, now as an adult, now as a parent, I realized that this gift was a brilliant negotiation tool for mom and dad to sleep in just a little bit longer. Brilliant, right? Parents, I hope you're taking notes this morning. Let your kids pick out one present on Christmas Eve night, after church, after dinner, after pajamas. Tell them, hey, when you get up in the morning, whatever time that may be, you can go to the tree, you can open up, and you can play with this one gift. And then when mom and dad wake up, then and only then can we open up the rest. Brilliant. So... What I would do is I would always pick out the biggest boxed gift under the tree. I'd set it aside and I would say, this is the gift that I will be opening first thing on Christmas morning. Then I'd go to sleep, I'd wake up around 6 a.m., I'd come out to the tree and I'd open the gift. One year, the gift was a cush ball mini basketball hoop that you would put on a door. Remember everybody from the 90s remember the cush ball? Oh Yeah. One year it was a pair of rollerblades. I loved, I loved rollerblading, loved a little street hockey as a kid. Uh, one year it was a Nerf football with a little whistle attachment. So when you threw it, it would whistle as you threw it. And then one year the gift was a brand new car. No, no, that didn't happen. But I think I see my mom over there. It's not too late. It's not too late. Oh, but the first Christmas gift for me was always the most exciting part of Christmas morning. Why? Because I knew every Christmas Eve night without fail and like clockwork, I could go to bed imagining, dreaming, anticipating, and wondering what that first gift would be. As a kid, there's nothing more exciting and wonderful than Christmas morning. But it is amazing how with time, as we get older, we can lose that sense of wonder that sense of excitement, we can lose what we could call that Christmas anticipation. But let me just remind you a week before Christmas hits that the reason that we're excited for Christmas is not for the scooters and the skates. It's of course not the bikes or the baseball bats. No, the reason that that we are filled with wonder and excited on Christmas regardless of our age is because the King has come. 
It's because King Jesus has come. Emmanuel, God with us, has come. And he has brought with him three amazing gifts for you and for me. More specifically, according to scripture, our king came with three gifts. Notice verse 10 again of the Christmas story. And I want you to notice the emotion that's referenced here. The angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Of great joy. In other words, the king has come and he will grant to all who believe not just joy, but great joy. I'm reminded of Psalm 1611 where the psalmist said, speaking of the king, that in your presence is fullness of joy. I'm reminded of 1 Peter 1.8 where it says, speaking of the king, that though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is the inexpressible gift filled with glory. So what is the first gift that the king brings? King Jesus came bringing not just joy, but great joy, transcendent joy, supernatural joy. And then later the choir of angels come and they back up what was kind of that solo angel artist. They back them up and they sing of another emotion in verse 14 and they say there will be peace for all those with whom God is pleased. Peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. So the king came with three gifts. He came with the gift of joy, he came with the gift of peace, and the third gift that he brought is also found there in verse 14, and it's the gift that because of the king, we become pleasing to God. In other words, Jesus the king came to make us pleasing to or right with God. And because of that position, we will experience two fundamental, transformative, supernatural emotions of peace and joy. In Romans chapter 14, I'm going to turn there quickly, but I believe it'll be on your screen. In Romans 14, and uh, Paul is preaching and talking about reminding the people that the king has a domain, that the king has a kingdom. We talked about this last week if you were here. And in verse 17, notice what he says. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Do you realize what Paul is doing here? He is echoing what those angels said on that first Christmas night, on that holy night. Oh, don't be fooled by baby Jesus, wrapped in rags, lying in a feeding trough. Remember that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords, and that he came to establish a kingdom. And that kingdom is defined by three gifts that he brings. It's not defined by eating and drinking. It's not defined by the temporary pleasures of this world. The kingdom of God isn't so much external as it is internal. The kingdom of our great God and King is about righteousness, peace, and joy. Let's talk about those three gifts this morning. What is this gift of righteousness? Well, righteousness is the gift that Jesus gives to all who believe and who receive him as Savior and as Lord. The Bible's very clear. It says, if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved and given the gift of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it this way, that he who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So righteousness is a big word. We use it a lot in church culture. It's replete in scripture. It's part of our Christian vernacular. But righteousness is really just a big word that means that you are now right with God. That you are now pleasing to God, period. And that's important. Some of you need to hear that word today. That's a word from the Lord for you today. Because sometimes what happens is we wonder, based on our performance, whether or not we're still in good standing with God. And we say things like, ah, oh, God just seems distant. It kind of feels like God's mad at me. I just have this feeling that God is looking down on me, frowning, shaking his head at me. In other words, what we tend to do in our flesh is we tend to superimpose our instability and our emotional roller coaster of an existence and we place it upon a God who doesn't change. And so we say things like, well, I guess my performance or my morality or my religiosity dictates how God sees me on a day-to-day -day basis. But, but listen, let me remind you of something. If your performance can't save you, then your performance can't unsave you. 
In other words, God is not pleased with you because of what you've done or what you will do. He's not, he's not pleased with you because of your potential, your untapped potential. No, God is pleased with you because of what Jesus Christ has done. He's pleased with you because of Jesus. And therefore, if you are in Christ, then you are pleasing to God no matter what you did or what you thought this last week as you fought the crowds at Costco. And some of you whispered some ugly things under your breath when you stood in line. I can see it all over your face. But God still loves you. He's still, still for you because you've received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Folks, this is such good news. The king has come to bring and to give the gift of righteousness, which means you are right with God if you will simply receive the gift that Jesus came to bring. Righteousness is a gift that cannot be earned. Righteousness is a gift that is certainly undeserved, but righteousness is a position that grants you supernatural status and transcendent emotions. One of those emotions is the gift of peace. Bible scholars actually agree that righteousness and peace are almost synonymous. They're almost synonymous terms. Peace with God is to be right with God. I mean, if you wanted to just kind of deconstruct that or reverse engineer that, you would say, well, to have a lack of peace with God means you have animosity with God. And to have animosity with God means you're separate from God. And to be separate from God means you don't have right standing with God. But because of King Jesus and what he came to do, because of King Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross and in the empty tomb, when we receive him and the gift that he came to bring, there comes with it a peace with God because we have a right standing with God. So we could properly say that righteousness and peace, though they're not the same word, that they're always together. They're like peas and carrots. In other words, wherever there is righteousness, there is peace. There's peace. Now, church, if we have not learned anything from the last couple of years, I think that there's one lesson that we can all agree on, and that is that there is something not right with this world. There, there's something wrong. There's a major problem within the heart of man. I mean, the stress, the global unrest, the financial distress, the political mess. I made them all rhyme. Wasn't that good? But, but all those things, man, I look at it, I'm like, peace out, 2023. I'm ready for a new year. I'm ready to clear the slate and start, start again. I told God, I said, look, I don't know if your spiritual calendar always lines up with our natural calendar, but this year, could it? And I'm believing that. I really am. For my family, for my church, for each one of you, I'm asking God and I'm believing God for new mercies, for new blessing, for a fresh anointing, for a new beginning in 2024. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. <laughs> But as much as that's true, I think what's also important is we kind of have this opportunity kind of to, to reset in some ways. It's also important that we don't miss the lessons that this past year has taught us. And, and let's agree that there's something that's not right with this world. The, the, the fighting amongst peoples and nations, the, the cultural chaos that divides, the, the, the poison that permeates politics and the policies, it's a problem. It, it's a problem that isn't so much external as it is internal. It isn't so much physical as it is spiritual. In, in other words, what I'm trying to say to you is that there's something wrong with this world because there's something wrong with the heart of man. And that's why the Bible says the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. <laughs> it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit of Jesus. In the spirit of Jesus. In other words, it's spiritual. Our problem is primarily spiritual, and therefore the solution is spiritual. And that's why King Jesus came with three gifts that affect the inner core of who we are. He gives us a profound knowing in our mind, and he gives us a sense in the spirit that I am right with my creator and my God, that, that I am right with my Father in heaven. And where there is righteousness, there is peace. Philippians 4 says that he gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Oh, I love the kind of peace that King Jesus came to bring. Because this verse leads me to understand that where knowledge stops, peace does not. We talked about this last week with all the information in the world that we have at our fingertips. It doesn't bring peace. It brings fear. It brings frustration. 
But the Bible says that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That's what the king came to give you today, in this season and into this new year, a peace, a peace that is transcendent, a peace that is supernatural, a peace that will guard you, and a peace that will protect you from fear, anxiety, and depression. I mean, did you notice that this peace is active? Man, this, this peace is almost an aggressive peace. Do you know why? Because this peace is a person. This peace has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is the prince of peace. In other words, this gift of peace is more than just an emotion. This gift of peace is more than just a state of mind. Peace is a person who stands at the door of your heart and of your mind, and he fights off anxiety and fear and doubt and depression on your behalf. And when I seek to find peace elsewhere, somewhere in this fallen world, the Prince of Peace reminds me that only he can provide the peace that I so desperately need. Can we give the Prince of Peace praise this morning? He's worthy of it. <sighs> Righteousness, peace, and joy. The three gifts that the king has laid out for you and me on this Christmas. And they're there. They're there for you. If you will simply believe in him as Savior, and if you'll receive him as Lord, you'll be in right standing with God forever. You'll be given a peace that surpasses your ability to even understand it. And you'll be given a joy, not just any old joy, but deep joy, profound joy, great joy. Church, as we come to the end of 2023, we've got just, a, what, two weeks left. I ask you, I want you to think about this. I want you, you to let the Holy Spirit kind of reveal to you what's happened to you this past year. Think about some of the challenges that you faced. What have you endured? What have you seen what have you felt? What have been some of the valleys, the challenges that you've faced? How bad, how rough, how tough have some of those moments been for you? Maybe between you and a loved one, maybe, maybe with you and your job, maybe just within your own mind and in your own heart, how bad has 2023 been in its moments? Has your joy taken a beating? Have you lost your joy? I want you to know this morning that there's a joy that King Jesus gives that transcends however bleak your bank account looks. I want you to know that, that King Jesus gives you a joy that surpasses your relational status or your, your relational situation. There's a joy that King Jesus gives that can overwhelm and can overcome the pain, the loss, the drama, the sickness, the stress, the struggle that we have just from striving on a day in and day out basis. In other words, regardless of what you've been through, regardless of what you're currently going through, we need to find our joy in Jesus Christ. We need to be able to just stop and say and pray, Lord Jesus, I'm just so grateful to be alive today. Lord Jesus, I'm just so grateful that you have saved me. Lord Jesus, I'm thankful that I am yours and that you are mine. Jesus, my marriage might be a mess and my job might be unfulfilling and not meeting my financial obligations. My health this year may have been horrible, but my joy in you cannot be shaken. I'm not saying that we celebrate the struggles, but what I am saying is that we celebrate Jesus in spite of the struggle. Amen. Amen. I'm just saying that sometimes, even if we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it's okay for us to stop and to say, you know what? Woo, there's a storm swirling around me. But God has been so good to me. God's gonna continue to be so good to me. So Merry Christmas to myself. I think that's okay. <laughs> In other words, sometimes we just need to stop and preach the joy of Jesus to ourselves. Amen. Man, you guys get to hear me preach once a week. I gotta hear myself preach every single day to myself. I'm like, yeah, Tim, this is hard, but you've been made right with God because of Jesus. Yeah, we live in a perilous time, but you've been forgiven and you've been given a phenomenal future and a hope because of Jesus. Yeah, Brock, you've been hurt and you've cried this year, but Jesus collects your tears, he hears your prayers, and he cares about you and what you're going through. Yeah, you suffered loss. 
Yeah, some of you have said some earthly goodbyes this past year. And yeah, this time of year can make the memories of those that you've lost, the memories of those that are not going to be sitting around that Christmas table this year, even more difficult and more painful to endure. But because of Jesus, I'll see my dad again. Because of Jesus, there's going to be a great reunion with him and all the saints of God in glory again. We have that future. We have that hope. So, I mean, I don't know about you, but excuse me while I just have a joy moment that's not connected to my earthly circumstances. We've got to have a future. We've got to have a vision of what God has for us. And that's the joy of the Lord in our heart. Have you ever run into somebody like that? Somebody who's been following Jesus so closely. They've been following Jesus for so long that it's like they forget to inform themselves of how difficult and dire their current situation and circumstances are. You know, you're like, you're looking at them and they just got like that perma smile on their face. I call it the Holy Ghost giggle. They just got that Holy Ghost. Everything's funny and wonderful to them. You know, they just got this peace and this joy that's kind of perplexing when we know too much because I'll be like, man, what's wrong with you? I know those prayer requests that you've been asking us as, the, as a church to pray for. I know that the challenges that you've been facing, the hurt that you've been feeling, you should be sad, you should be mad, you should be cranky, you should be that cranky Christian. But instead, they're, they're happy, they're, they're hopeful. Their joy is overcoming and overwhelming their sorrow. Why? Because they've attached their faith to the king. And the king has come with a joy that is beyond our current circumstances. Again, Romans 14, 17 says that the kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking. In other words, food and drink and all the temporary pleasures of this world will never be enough to produce righteousness, peace, and joy. And, and listen, I hope that you have some tasty treats, some fabulous food this Christmas season. I hope that you can enjoy some great drinks with friends and family over the next couple of weeks and days. But let's not forget that this internal problem cannot be solved by external means. We need a king, a king who brings us gifts that we really need, and he places them at the deepest center of who we are, at the deepest center of our soul. We need a king who can make us right with our creator, our father, our God. And a king who gives us two transcendent, supernatural, transformative emotions of peace and joy. 2023 is quickly coming to an end. <laughs> a new day, a new dawn, a new season, a new year is coming. But let's finish up 2023 strong and let's enter into 2024, church, grateful for the gifts that King Jesus was born to give. Righteousness, peace. Enjoy. Father, we thank you that you are a king, <laughs> the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and that you bring the best gifts. You offer the best gifts. And so, Father, I pray that this week, especially leading up to next Sunday and next Monday, God, I pray that we would see and receive the gifts that you have laid out before us. May we just wonder at your generosity. May we wonder at, at your grace. May we wonder at your love. May, be, may we truly be amazed at, at the goodness of our God. And Lord, I pray for my church family right now. <laughs> God, I thank you for these incredible people. I thank you for the love that they have for you. I thank you for the love that they've shown to me and to my family. They're, they're a precious people. And I pray that you bless them. But Lord, I know that as people, we have our problems. And so, God, I pray that if what surrounds these people is bleak, if what they're facing is challenging, if it's dark, if it's difficult, I pray, God, that they would remember that what remains sure and untouched, what the enemy cannot take, what their health diagnosis cannot take, what their relational drama cannot take, is our righteousness, our peace, and our joy that comes from you, King Jesus. And we thank you and we praise you for it. And we pray this in your great name. Amen and amen. All right, don't forget, you get an announcement before we sing. Next Sunday, Christmas Eve, unique schedule. 
We're creatures of habit. The habit has to change just for one week to keep you on your toes. Amen. So we're going to have one service in the morning, not nine and 11, one service at 10. Again, Pastor Matt, and the youth will be leading it. Pastor Matt will be preaching it. It's going to be a youth takeover service. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to get to see the next generation in action, give us a little a vision of the future, and then come back again at 4 or 5.30, or if you're just a hardcore Christian, come to both. Amen. And it's going to have, we're going to have a special Christmas Eve candlelight communion service. It's, it's a special tradition that we pray that you'll be a part of. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be breathtaking. It's going to be Christ honoring. You won't want to miss it. Make plans to join us. Make plans to, to make this part of your tradition moving forward. Invite your friends, your neighbors, your extended family, and let's worship and celebrate the Christ of Christmas together as a church family. Amen? I love you guys. Let's stand and worship.